Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Clint I'm an alcoholic. Thank you very much, I and thank you, Bob, for asking me to come up here, and thank you, John. It's good to see and hear you. There's a, a great energy here, and if you're new, I want you to know that I appreciate that energy. I think we need it. I think that there is... Um, you know, for for years I have tried to uh, think about why just because a guy leaves uh, and stops going to meetings, the result is almost always inevitable and predictable, and he's going to drink or do something after a while if he's alcoholic. And it has um, been my observation in the last few years that it's the energy here that feeds our soul. It's the energy in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous like this meeting that is so critically important to us. And you can have that same energy in a smaller meeting, of course. You can have that same energy in any part of the country. You can have that same energy in uh, uh, any AA meeting that you go to. And if it's there you can tell it, and you sort of want to register on that energy. And so if you're new here, look for that energy. If you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, and if you want to have an experience that is is good for your soul, it'll always, in in my experience, be in meetings where the energy is high. And I don't think there's any reason for us to go to meetings where the energy is missing. Uh, sometimes people down in L.A. where I come from say, well, uh, that meeting over there is dying, and if you could just kind of come over and uh, help us uh, get it going, uh, we'd appreciate it. Uh, I don't go. Uh, I don't think it's my job to help a dying meeting do anything but die. (laughs) Because it's dying for a reason. It's not meeting a need. I like to stay where the energy is high. And it's high here. And it's wonderful here. And I am very, very glad to be here. I'm very, very glad to be here. Uh, I had my last drink in August on the 14th of 1966. And so I'm coming up on 40 years. Um, I used to say God willing, uh, and it turns out he is willing. Uh, (laughs) uh, The the question is whether I'm willing, you know, whether I'm willing to keep my butt in a meeting, in a a chair in AA, um, and the big book in my life. And I'm willing. I'm willing. We have, all of us, some important days, particularly important days in our lives. Do you remember the the time, and John referred to it, uh, that first drink? I don't mean the, you know, a little thimble of something when you were five years old, but there was a time when you had that first drink. That one, that one that made you realize that being alive wasn't necessarily painful. Didn't hurt to be alive. For a moment, the question was, where has this stuff been? I was 16 years old after a football game at a party. Somebody passed around vodka. I hadn't drank before that night. And I knew a couple of things that night. I knew that life was fair. I knew that, uh, I knew why my dad drank. I knew that, um, 
if this was a sin, as my mom had told me that I was going to be doing a lot of sinning, and I knew not to act drunker than I was, and the feeling that I got that night was, I suppose, as important as any feeling I got. And it really was the absence of all the negative feelings. I had taken to that drink uh, a deep sense of uh, disappointment, a deep sense of unfairness, a deep sense of self-pity, a deep sense of um, confusion. Uh, we were raised in a home that was very religious and None of that really made much sense to me. I didn't like uh, the message. I didn't like the idea that my entire uh, eternal future turned on what I believed. It didn't, because uh, I couldn't get myself to believe a lot of the things that they said I had to believe. That seemed to be the whole structure of what was a hellfire and brimstone Southern Baptist uh, kind of an atmosphere in our home, where the the messages were mixed, and there was a lot of, uh, in my mind, uh, inconsistency, and you didn't ask, you didn't challenge it, because uh, the answer was always the same, because God says so, or because it's in the Bible. And uh, those are not satisfactory answers for uh, me. Well, you know, what the difference is a lot of people do very well on belief. But we need experience. And that booze was the experience that I needed. And we've needed experience since we got sober to move along a little further. We need to recognize the experience for what it is. And the belief thing, the experiences will ripen into belief for me. And I think we all wind up at the same place, but I'm I'm really one of these guys that needs an experience, and if you uh, haven't been able to get very far on belief, and if you're new here, I've got good news for you. You will not, we don't, we, the word faith is in the big book, but if you read that as blind faith, that's not what they're talking about. A faith is a confident trust born of experience. And we had the experience. Remember when you bought a bottle and you couldn't drink it right then and you locked it in the glove compartment for later and you felt better? That's faith. That's faith. Or you go into the doctor and you get a, it's a piece of paper. And you know the next stop is the pharmacy where you're going to get that prescription feel filled. And you put that piece of paper in your pocket so you'll have plenty of amphetamines later to study all night. And you feel better. You hold the door open. After you, miss. Sure, what the hell. You get so elegant. Hi, how are you? And all that's happened is there's a piece of paper in my pocket. That's faith, because I know I'm going to get the prescription filled. And I know that night I'll be able to underline every page in the book in at least three colors. So I'll remember it. And then you take the test and you write the same answer in response to every question on the paper. <laughs> Always an enlightened moment. Faith, that's what we mean. A belief is an expectancy. Those words were part of the Bible deal. And I never really looked to see what they were. I believe that um, my wife will be there tomorrow when I get home. I just believe that. But it's based on, and I have that expectancy. And I have faith that she'll be there because I've had experience like that. And it's no more and no less than that. But that first drink I had when I was 16 years old really turned a corner because 
of the feeling I got from it, the experience, the emotional experience I got from it. It otherwise wouldn't have touched me. Wouldn't have touched me. Can you imagine if there was uh, nothing in a drink of scotch that turned the corner for you? How much scotch would we drink? Oh, I like the taste of scotch. Really? Take the alcohol out of it and tell me how well you like that taste. Not so much. We need the other experience. And we get it. And we get it in spades if we're alcoholic. And we believe, and Dr. Jung kind of dispelled this myth, but we believe that the alcohol caused the feeling. We believe that the alcohol caused the feeling, and alcohol isn't powerful enough for that. Alcohol is powerful enough to ruin a life, and it certainly ruined mine. But it can't bring about what you can only describe as a glimpse of your own divinity at that moment. In other words, the clouds moved away. I took a lot of bad beliefs and experiences to that first drink. The disappointment, the anger, the upset, the confusion, all of that. And for a moment, they were gone. The clouds moved aside. And I could sense, without knowing it, without having any idea of what I was experiencing, I, I experienced my own divinity. I couldn't have said that then. Dr. Young gives us a little clue about it, and some neuropsychiatric people have given us better clues since then. And when those clouds part, we see a completely different world. We sense who we really are. And we sense it with an intensity that can't be denied, and of course, because we're seekers, because we love what we have experienced, we go back again and again and again and again. And we never quite get it again. Not like that. Not like that. But it has us on the chase. And it's because we're seekers. We want that feeling. We want that experience. And uh, we do a lot of goofy things to get it. And that was when I was 16 years old, and 13 years went by, and I was um, living in, uh, I called it a double garage. It never was that elegant. It was just a shed. Um, in fact, some years ago now, Linda and I were over in Glendale where I got sober, and she said, I want to see that garage where you got sober. And we drove down in there. She said, is that it? And I said, yeah. She said, that's not a garage. That's a shed is what that is. And uh, by God, it was a shed and is a shed, still there. Four of us lived there, little cut-up rooms, uh, just smelly, nasty little. My room was smelly and nasty. I didn't uh, spend a lot of time in their rooms. There was a shower someplace. Uh, I heard him using it. It was an unconfirmed report from my point of view. I never really <laughs> went there. I had a little, um, I had a clock radio that was disturbing in that it would just suddenly start to play. You know what I mean? I just play. You unplug it and it would play. And you take it out and put it in the dirt and it would play. Uh, I remember after I'd gotten sober, been sober about six months, I heard a gal say she got arrested because she took a hammer to a parking meter. I asked her after the meeting why she had done that, and she said because it was broadcasting every rotten thing she'd ever done. And I thought, yeah, I get that. I knew a little more about my radio that day. And there was, of course, an uh, old copy of uh, Playboy magazine in there that uh, had become my social life. Uh, you know what I mean. Can you imagine? Honey, I'm home, you know, one of those. 
Jesus. I mean, I didn't fall from a high place when I, uh, I got here. And that was as good as it was. I woke up one morning, I'm under the bed in that sticky linoleum floor under that smelly mattress, and the rat was over there by the door. God, it just terrified me, that thing. Look at, And we're kind of eye level. And then the first light of day, and I looked again, and that rat had turned into a pair of socks laying over there on the... And so if you're new, and I welcome you, uh, and you've been held hostage by a pair of socks all night, I, uh, <laughs> I'm your guy. You found us. Here we are. I'm the guy at the end of the bar who you said, if I ever get as bad as that guy, I'll do something about my drinking. I'm the guy in the next cell. And the next uh, moment, and we sometimes skip right through this, was one that I've given a lot of thought to. The next moment that's significant in our lives is that moment beyond which we didn't drink. And we don't talk a lot about it in AA. I don't know why. I think we glossed it over. I think we can't let ourselves know the magic, the majesty, the power of that moment. I'd been taken to Alcoholics Anonymous by a bail bondsman the first time I went in Glendale. And I was around the Glendale Alamo Club for three weeks, didn't drink, and then I found a, went back to my room one night after a meeting and ran across a stash of cash and amphetamines, and that requires a drink, as you know. And I was gone for two weeks and came back to L.A. and walked over to the club, Alano Club of Glendale, whatever that might mean, up a long flight of stairs. And somebody was in that club that morning doing his job in A.A., and I say that because the door was open and the lights were on and the coffee was made. And a guy by the name of Bill Kennedy was there. And he was a gorgeous guy. And he had a gorgeous smile. And he had the look about him that people get in a, the look of people that are consistently willing to give more than they get out of life. He had that going on. So he smiled a lot and he laughed a lot. And when he saw me come in, he smiled. How you doing? He said. Oh, Keith, how you doing? I said, I'm not doing so good. He said, what happened? I said, I got drunk. Got drunk and let everybody down, is what I told him. Like, hey, and Glendale's going to collapse now. I don't know what the hell I thought. but you know. He said, he could have said a lot of things. He said, I probably would. I'm not as gentle and kind as John is. Yeah. I would have said something cute. I don't know what it was, but it wasn't my turn to talk. I just said I got drunk, and he asked me one brief question. He said, oh, are you alcoholic? And I really didn't know the answer to that question. I should have known. I knew what the right answer was. I was 29 years old, and I finally said, yeah, I've been an alcoholic about a month now. Uh, yeah, just caught it. I don't know what happened. I'm trying to pitch a mild case, you know what I mean? It's like, I won't be any trouble. I'll snap right out of this. And he blew right past that. He didn't even stop at that inference. He just said, so, you're alcoholic and you got drunk. And I said, yeah. Now, the, now we both know something about me that I had not 
allowed myself to think. I'm an alcoholic and I get drunk. He said, if you're an alcoholic of my type, you're going to drink no matter what. Now we both know something really secret. And it's out there in the air. I'm going to drink no matter what. I knew that at some level, and I couldn't have said it to save my life. He said, you're going to drink no matter what, if you're an alcoholic of my type. And I drink no matter what. He said, good people in AA will tell you, don't drink no matter what, and you will drink no matter what. And I, I drink no matter what, and I had never admitted that to myself. I was always going to quit. If I want to quit bad enough, by God, I will quit. And the awful day comes when I want to quit, and I can't quit. Well, next time. And this idea that I will drink no matter what had never really been allowed to be in my consciousness. And he said it with a smile and with a certain casualness. He let me have the simple dignity of the fact of the matter. I'm going to drink no matter what. I mean, I tell you, I will pick up the kids. Somebody else has to pick up my kids. I'll bring the check home. The check has no chance of getting home. No. Because I drink no matter what. Promises mean nothing to me. Money is only one use for it. Children and inconvenience. I have three sons, seven grandkids, and to think of them today as an inconvenience is mind boggling. I went back two weeks ago to Massachusetts. They have a university, Harvard University, back there. My oldest grandson graduated two, year, two weeks ago. Uh, hard to think of that boy as an inconvenience because he's not. Hard to think of his father as that. But a drink an alcoholic can make all of that part of his thought. And I did. And so I drink no matter what. Now I got it. That secret is out. It's just floating in the air. It's out. As soon as one other person knows it, and as soon as I know it, it's out. And Kennedy said, uh, why don't you just stay here today? You're going to drink no matter what, but stay here today. Stay here. If you want something to eat later on, we'll fix your sandwich. Stay here. Sit down and Take it easy. The, the knowing that the secret is out, that I'll drink no matter what, that I drink, that I just do that, there's kind of a relief with it that accompanies that knowing. I knew also that I'd be on Skid Row in about three weeks. The fight's over, and there's kind of a relief. People that have surrendered at least from what we see on the network news. What do they do? They throw their rifles down and they go sit at the side of the road and they wait for somebody to come along and tell them what to do. And I threw my defenses down. I just let them go. The defenses of, uh, I'm not hurting anybody but myself, the defenses said, uh, I'll quit, I'll be able to quit. All of that went and I sat there and in effect waited for somebody to come along and tell me what to do. And there wasn't anything real dramatic that happened that day except I surrendered to the fact that I will drink no matter what. And it is in that condition that uh, we... 
there's no obstacle between me and this amazing power that we experience in AA. God enters through that wound, I think. And he does it with such elegance. There is, um, I mean, you slip quietly into the a remarkable miracle, the quiet miracle of a sober life. And you don't drink after that. God removed that obsession to drink that day. Never had another. I've been crazy enough to drink. I've been angry enough to drink. I've been happy enough to drink. I've been insane enough. I've been unhappy enough. I've failed enough. I succeeded enough. I didn't. In what's going to come up 40 years, I didn't drink. Wilson says, uh, God appears to most men gradually, but his impact on me was sudden and profound. And I used to think, oh, how nice for you, Bill. Jesus, that's great. You and Sister Ignatius horsing around that hospital, God knows what. But that's my story. You know, one day the book comes alive and you say, wow, it was sudden. And it is sudden. I mean, on the 13th of August, I was a drunk and a bad one. On the 14th of August, I didn't drink and haven't had a drink since then. Now, that's sudden. That is moving right along. And he did it without my consent, for God's sakes. We had a guy over in California who used to say, if I'd have known that was going to be my last drink, I would have had two. (laughs) Yeah, I'll bet. You'd be like, hey, here we go, we're quitting. <laughs> and it doesn't really, we gloss this over in some weird way. But if it was about quitting, and I'm saying this because there are new people in the room, and you have the secret knowledge that you can't quit, and you think you have to quit. Uh, if you if you could quit, you wouldn't have come here. Nor would we. Nor does AA ask us to quit. Isn't that weird? Step one, quit. No, no. Step one, you got to get that you are toast is basically it. Powerless, unmanageable, all those fun words. That's a very important thing because we blow right past that. They used to tell an absurd story about a guy that was blind and then uh, had an amazing experience and he could see. And he was asked... What happened to you? He says, I don't know. I used to be blind and now I can see. And we understand that story. Happens fast. Blink of an eye fast. And it's an important moment. And if you're like me, you have a tendency to take credit for that moment. Well, I decided to go to AA and just clean it up. Really? Wow. When the hell did you have the power to do that? I never did. I never did. Bill Kennedy dealt with me at the level of my, not at my merit, but at the level of my need, my deep need and set the stage and created the environment and my life changed in a heartbeat. And I'm very grateful for that. And over the course of this time with you in AA, I've come to appreciate that more and more. Because 
it dispels forever the fact that God does not take a personal interest in me. And when I uh, grew up, I was convinced that he could not and did not take a personal interest in me. I was convinced that everything I heard from my the church people and my family was just wrong. And some of it was, you know. You try to talk at home about one of those homes about uh, sex, for example. It's not going to go very far. Uh, it, it, it just kind of turns a room to concrete, you know. And it's a powerful motive and powerful force in our lives, and you're curious about it. And you don't get much at home. You don't get specifics at home. You just get kind of a, well, we don't talk about that. And you're left with some strange ideas. And you pick up even stranger ideas on the street. And it all distills into a beauty. Here it is. Sex is ugly and disgusting. And you should save it for the one you really love. Thanks, Mom. Uh, and so I didn't believe much else of what they had to say either. But the experience, God, the experience, not of sex. I'm not, I've moved on now. That too, of course. Uh, hmm, nothing ugly about this. Ooh. We need the experience. And we need to see it for what it is. We need to see the miracle. I didn't do that. I did not do that. That was done for me. And after I got past taking credit for that miracle, I began to see other things in that book. There's a line in that book that's fascinating. Uh, it says, Our troubles we think arise out of ourselves. It takes a while to understand, for me to understand, that what that really means is that nobody else has to change for me to get free. No one else has to change for me to get free. And I've spent my life believing that other people should change so I'll be happy. I wanted her to change. I wanted dead people to change. If my grandma would have shaped up, well, she's dead. She's not going to change, pal. Oh. I mean, when I'm driving into town in the morning in, in Los Angeles and that SUV comes into my lane, and it is my lane, I think we know that. <laughs> I think if she'd have stayed out of that lane so I can get to town 10 seconds earlier, I would be a happier boy. Isn't that amazing? I was dating a gal years ago now, and she hung up the phone on me hung up on me, on me. And for three or four days, I wanted her to die. I don't mean it was a passing thought. I gave this a lot of energy. <laughs> Who does she think she is? As if her death would make me feel better somehow. That's a strange way to live, isn't it? And I don't know why they say that uh, my life doesn't work all that well, because I'd been sober some years when I had that week of misery. Our troubles arise out of ourselves, but we don't usually think so. And that's in that simple little quote lies a lot of trouble for us. A lot of trouble for me. And there's only one answer to it. And that is that if anybody's going to do any changing, 
it's got to be me. And then you go through a whole period of time where you think that it's your obligation. I thought it was my obligation to change myself. And that conviction, uh, because I had made a virtue out of doing everything myself. I mean, we're raised on that. You're a big boy now, tie your own shoes, walk to school, do this, do that. It's up to you. And I want to be a virtuous guy, so I wanted to do it all myself. And that's still very much a part of me. When, when I, here's how it goes. It, it, it tells us in step 11 that the first thing we're going to do upon awakening is basically to ask God to direct our thinking. And that's a very important request because I have two lines of thinking available to me. I can come from a, my thinking can come from a relationship with my ego, in which case I want to be right, or it can come from a relationship with God, in which case I need a relationship with God, and I'm quite willing to be happy. And there's no real mixing of those two lines of thought. If I ask God to direct my thinking, and if I have in relationship to God, there is going to be a different result. And I'll want to be happy. That's when I turn my attention to my wife to see who is she today. Because I know, I know she's not yesterday's woman. She's yesterday's woman plus her experiences yesterday, which is an exciting idea and always reminds me that I'm today's guy and not yesterday's guy. But if I want to be right, then I see her as last year's woman. And when is she ever going to shape up? It's a whole different way of looking and being and thinking. And it's a simple enough request. My wife and I work together. She manages my law firm. And our offices are about 60 feet apart. And someday the biggest surrender of the day is that 60 feet where I get up from my desk and walk down the hall and walk into her office and say, I used a snotty tone when I spoke to you this morning, and I'm sorry for that. And she's very generous in response. She never makes me sorry that I said that. But I have to keep it cleaned up with her. But if I want to be happy if I want to see that look in her eye. This, these are hard-fought lessons. These are lessons that I continue to learn in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I've been blessed in AA. I've had good sponsorship. I've had good friends, really good friends like Bob and John and people in this room. But I got a big problem, and that is that one of the one of the things that's going on with me is that I have old ideas. Wilson calls them old ideas. And, for example, I learned as a kid uh, that the only way to be with women is to keep in mind that you can't trust them. Now, that's not exactly uh, a way to have a relationship. You can have an arrangement that way, which is a far different deal. I mean, a relationship has kind of a sacred component to it, a, a, a sacred base to it. And an arrangement is a contract. You, you pretend that my image is valid and I'll pretend that your image is valid. You bring the sex, I'll bring the cash. Whatever the arrangement is, there's a lot of arrangements. And there's a punishment clause in those contracts, of course. So you know how to treat her when she has done something bad. There's no punishment clause in a relationship. And you can't have an arrangement with God. He ain't going for it. 
you can have a relationship, the sacred one. And I didn't know the difference, but it hardly mattered because I knew we wouldn't be together, this lady and I, whoever she was, for very long. And knowing that and knowing I couldn't trust her made it necessary for me to groom the next one before I was out of this one. And you can't go very far on that. And I had endless trouble with that, only because I had this strange idea that was never true that I can't trust women. Drunk, I knew that. Sober, I knew that. And I didn't... After I'd been sober a number of years, I had enough trouble in my life that I was actually impelled to listen to a guy that said I needed to take these steps. And I had been frightened long enough, lived with a deep fear of failure, of pushing a cart around the city. My brother had died doing that. I knew it was in me to extend to that kind of a existence. By this time, I had been practicing law for a number of years, and the money was gone, and the partner was gone, and the lady was gone, and the house was on the market, and all of that. And so I was very frightened. And I had an image in AA that was killing me. And so when he came along out of nowhere, again, God's grace said, I'll take you through the steps. I said, okay, okay, okay. And we get through all of that, and we get to the amends step. And I found myself, of all places, in the low rent part of the cemetery in Billings, Montana, where my mother was buried and had been buried since I was 14 years old. And I had stood at that grave the last time when she was buried and said, you don't love me, I don't love you either. And I tried to make that true. That was never true. I tried to make it true that I could never trust her, and it was never true. And I carried that lump of nonsense in my gut for a long time. And now I'm back at that cemetery many, many years later. And I'm kneeling, and I'm taking a pair of clippers that a member of al and She came to me with a sack. She said, you got to go out there today? I said, yeah. Take this with you. And in the sack was a liter of water and some flower seeds and some clippers and some napkins and some Kleenex. She said, you're going to need these things. And, you know, there's no memo on this. All I know is that morning I had made the ninth step prayer, take me to my next amends and give me the power to make it. We've entered the world of the Spirit about that time. We have tapped into power power that I needed wasn't my power. We kind of have to get past that. Too. We have to get past this crazy idea that God can't be inside me. Great reality is deep within. I don't think so. And one day you know the great reality is deep within. If you're doing those steps, one day you know that it never was your power, like I'm a guy out there in the ocean about three miles and I'm in a raft and I got a single paddle and I'm working hard to get in to shore and all I can do is make that raft go around in tight little circles. I can't get anywhere. And I'm working my butt off. And then the thought, the amazing thought, take your shirt and tie it to the paddle and stick it up in the air and tap into real power. Oh, my God. Well, it isn't my power. Shut up. Who cares? Tap into real power. And you get ashore. And I was there tapping into real power in a graveyard in Billings. And it was, uh, I guess that weekend I cried all my tears. I guess that weekend I knew that she had always loved me. That weekend I felt so silly because I, saw how I could always trust her. 
and we had quite a talk, my mom and me, and we've had some since that time. And I came out of that graveyard knowing things about women that I never knew before. And it was really only that after that that Linda could come into my life. Not that it happened the next day or the next month or anything like that, but I just changed in a deep way and became interested in relationships, and uh, which enhanced my relationship with God. And so we come to the end of the game. We take our long look back. We come to this moment, and we say, My God, you ask me what has happened to me in Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're new, do you have a sufficient substitute? Oh, I think so. And I think I know tonight what it is. I think I will tell you tonight, and this is what I came to tell you. The clouds do part. They parted at that cemetery. And I saw her divinity and I saw my divinity. They parted back in... Cambridge, Massachusetts, when I saw the divinity of my grandson and of his father and even of his grandmother. The clouds part. They part here tonight because of the extraordinary energy that you bring that I need so much. The energy of unconditional love. That's what it is. And don't think it's anything less and somebody, John, I guess, mentioned this. Somebody did. If you sit down at a meeting and a guy comes and sits down next to you and you find out he's alcoholic and you haven't seen him before but he's sober and you get to talking to him, how are you? And he says, uh, I'm not so good. What happened? I killed a cop last night. What are you going to do with that? In an AA meeting with this energy, you're going to say, don't leave. Most places they'd run screaming into the night. We say, don't leave. You've got a mess on your hands, brother, but we can talk about it after the meeting. But what we pray for him at that moment is that he can stay, soak up some of these en this energy and be in a position to face that problem and not make it worse. That's what we want for him. And at that moment, he's getting unconditional love from us. Unconditional love, the same that any newcomer would get. And that's the way it works. I think that whole thing about anonymity and why it has such immense spiritual value is because of the unconditional love. In other words, we sponsor somebody and watch them get sober and flourish and they take a cake. and We know we didn't really do anything. We just got a front row seat to a miracle. But if we look again, we'll see that power came through us and that God chose us to love that person. And there's an unconditional quality to it. My love for my wife is conditional. I mean, what dress does she have to wear for me to be cool? And that's just the beginning of that little tip of the iceberg. But if I live my life in such a way that God can love her through me, now we're doing a whole different thing. Because God loves me through her. And that's the essence of a relationship. And today I have a relationship with my wife. I have a relationship with God. I have a relationship with Alcoholics Anonymous and its members. And I thank you for your energy.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.